The Bible reading today is taken from Mark chapter 2, verses 23 to 27. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Does the Bible really say that? And the Lord said to John, Come forth and have eternal life. But John came fifth and won a toaster. Well, I can confirm that the Bible does not say that John came forth and won a toaster. But that was still a funny gag. I found that pretty funny, so thanks, Aaron. Pastor Tim here, thanks so much for being part of the service this morning. We're in a series, the last week of our series, uh, that we've entitled, Does the Bible Say That?, where we have looked at a number of statements that either we maybe use ourselves, that we've heard in the church, or we believe that God said that, and in fact, they're not true at all, or either we say them, but we don't fully understand the context of them uh, at all. And also, maybe there is some truth to what it says, but with the statement that we give, it doesn't give the whole whole truth. And this morning, the last one that we want to look at um, is this, that God said it, I believe it, that settles it. God said it, I believe it, that settles it. And uh, when, when, we, when you first hear that statement, it's pretty hard to argue with. It just seems well. Absolutely. There's no doubting that at all. And here's one of the reasons why we have no doubt that God is sovereign to start with, that God is the supreme authority, that, that he is his creator. God is the power of the universe. In my uh, Bible uh, devotions in the past week, um, it, it described God this way, that he's perfect. Everything about him is perfect. His love is perfect. His, his wisdom is perfect. His peace is perfect that he offers, that he is perfectly good, holy, righteous, and, and just, that he is perfect in every way. So if God speaks, and who, who, who am I, who are you to, to contradict God? And again, I don't think any of us would doubt this, that knowing that, um, that we're sinners and we're anything but perfect, at times, our, our judgments are, are off. Our choices are off. Our words are, are not appropriate. Our, our actions aren't good at all. So, hey, if God says something, if he's supreme, then, then we have no standing at all to, to point out that God is wrong and that I'm right. But let me say, that's not how that statement is meant to be taken and we want to look into that you know if you're a parent or you've been a parent or grandparent or foster parent to a young child you do know this that one of their favorite if not their favorite question is this why why you know johnny you need to go and clean up your room why sammy it's it's important for you to not touch or go near the fire. Why? When our Sam was young, this was a thing that we had to keep reminding him of about the fire. It's it's hot. Why? Burn. Why? Pain. It'll cause pain. Why? And he really only learnt that lesson when he one day, Sonia and I weren't around for a second or two. He got hold of the vacuum cleaner and put the vacuum cleaner head into the 
into the fire while the vacuum cleaner was going and it sucked up some hot coals and it, I shouldn't laugh, but it burned his little hands and all of a sudden we heard him screaming and he, he learned his lesson that the mum and dad were, were right. And they were teaching me a lesson that was, that was actually good. It was actually helpful that they knew by experience and their knowledge that putting your hand, something near the fire that could burn it was going to cause pain. And the aim of a person that is a parent is to, is to teach their, their, their children lessons that are going to help them as they get older and as they grow up. And that they will understand why we would say to them things like, because I said so. That's why. Because I said so. So in that sense, when it's, we hear God said it, I believe it, that settles it. it. It expresses something that we need to keep in mind. Absolutely. And, and as Christians, there should be many times where our, our Christian faith corrects us. There should be when times when our natural instinct, our, our decision to do one thing um, is then corrected. We're corrected because... We want our faith to guide us with what, what is right, what is appropriate for us to reconsider our choices because of what God wants for us. You know, like this Peanuts uh, cartoon that's going to come up in just a second that um, what it does is expresses the, you know, a key posture that as Christians we should, we, we should take. And, and it says this, I, I hear you're writing a book. Charlie Brown says to Snoopy, a book on theology. I hope you have a good title, Charlie Brown says. And Snoopy says, I have the perfect title. The title is, has it ever occurred to you that you might be wrong? You know, we, we should be constantly measuring and adjusting and correcting what we do say. What we do do, how we spend our time, how we spend our money, based on what our faith teaches us. So then how, how can this statement, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, be a half-truth or be a statement where there's some wrong in it? Well, I want to suggest to you that while the, the plain statement of it all may be true, how you use it and how I use it and how those who say it around you use it can actually be used in, in the wrong way where there's actually no truth to it at all, where it can cause even pain. I, I, I want to let you into a little secret. If you're not a regular uh, church goer or you're a, um, someone that hasn't been in the church for a very long time. Now, those of us that have been in the church for a long time, we probably already know this, but sometimes Christians disagree. That might surprise you. But yes, sometimes Christians disagree. And they disagree on matters of faith. Now, at times, sadly, it has caused pain. It's called, caused division. Anything but how God wants us to be with one another. But there are times, though, we, we don't see eye to eye where we have faithful, intelligent men and women who disagree on matters of Christian practice and doctrine. On things like, um, yeah, on marriage, on God and politics, on worship. Sadly, even on things of what we should and what we shouldn't sing in church, on mental health, on abortion, on capital punishment, and the list goes on. And I'd say many times, my experience has been that these discussions do go well. People discuss it well. We, we listen, we try to understand what the other person is, is saying and where they're coming from and we listen to their experiences and their understanding of God and the Bible that's led them to believe what they believe. Yet sometimes we, we will, in a sense, it will be like a, a tennis match where we go back and forth with different sound bites and where we will quote, quote different verses. And we'll do that without really listening. 
And again, my experience has been there are times where frustration builds and someone will say something like, well, that's what the Bible says. And so I guess you don't believe in the Bible. Or I'm sorry that you don't like what the Bible says, but hey, it's right there in front of you. Or they will use the statement that we're looking at. Hey, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. And it's used to end the conversation. Now, now, as we discuss this, I, I want to point this out because some of you might be a little bit nervous, but I want to point this out to you. There, there are aspects that we read in the Bible that are absolute clear. There's no gray in any way that God is indeed, as it says, the creator of the heavens and earth, that he is the beginning and the end. That the God sent his son, Jesus, into this world and that he died on the cross in our place. And he not only died, but he overcame death and he rose again. That he is the way, the truth and the life. That, that things like Satan is evil. That Jesus, when quoted, says he will return, he will return. They, these are just a few. Yet, yet at times we have gone to the Bible and, and, and we've done it in such a way where we have no room at all for discussion. No room at all. And that's not always helpful. You know, I like the story a couple of years ago of a, of a pastor who received a Facebook message from a teenager in his congregation. And this teenager wanted a tattoo, but his father pulled out the Bible and quoted Leviticus 19.28. To not allow his son, to, he used it so he would not allow his son to get a tattoo. So the, the young man looked up this passage and found the verse before uh, the, the, the verse that the father quoted. And he, and he noticed that it included rules for men's haircuts and beards. And knowing his dad had a beard, he, he cited scripture back to his father, reminding him that getting a haircut, or at least in, in getting the side of his hair cut or any trimming of his beard was forbidden. Now, I'm not sure the end story, but I'm not sure if the pastor had to come in and be a referee in this. But, but when we have this space of saying there's no room for discussion, it can actually be a dangerous place for us to be at. When we say, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. You know, for some of us, this might be a controversial statement, but, but I want to put it out there that, that the Bible doesn't always speak with one clear voice. And, and I want to unpack that for us. If, if you think about this, how many thousands of Christian denominations do we have where, where, we, read, where we read various parts of the Bible differently? Now, I've been Baptist since birth, I like to say. Baptist since birth. And I think in many ways, my thinking has always been, well, it's the Baptist way or no way. But, but I'm just one denomination. We're just one. How do, how, how do we read the Bible? How you might read it might be a little different to how I read it. How, how, how can Christians disagree then? On what the Bible says. Isn't God's word written clearly and simply in the passages of scripture? Don't we just have to read it, believe it, and then let it be settled? You know, the Bible reading uh, out of Mark chapter 2 that was, I must say, just read just brilliantly. We, we, we see Jesus and his followers on the Sabbath. This Jewish Sabbath was a day of rest and it was instituted by God at creation. Further rules of the Sabbath we read about in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And one of the biggest no-nos for the Sabbath was to do any type of work. Now, and, and that was well understood that God had said no work whatsoever to be done on the Sabbath. So in fact, things like even food was prepared the day before that would be eaten on the Sabbath. And we read here that Jesus is walking through the fields on the Sabbath. And as he and his followers travel through they, they, they pick grain. They pick grain to be used for a meal later. 
And the religious leaders who, who knew the scriptures like the back of their hand, as they say, saw something and they said, this is unlawful because this is the Sabbath. Tending to crops, picking food, that was work. It was a clear violation of the scripture. Or so it was thought. And, and Jesus offers a different interpretation of scripture. Or even possibly even a contradiction. Scripture, he goes back to the creation story and says, God made humankind first and the Sabbath second. And he even re references yet another scripture where, where King David also went against what God had said. Jesus does this in Matthew. He, he expands on scripture, reinterprets when it says a statement like you have heard it says. And then he quotes Jewish scripture. But then he says, but I tell you, but I tell you. And he offers a new interpretation of scripture. See, a simple fact of Christian faith is that every Christian can interpret, interpret scripture. OK, we, well, let's, let's put that out there. But we cannot just read the Bible literally all the time. Jesus says things like this. If your right eye causes you to sin, then pluck it out. I'm guessing. There's not many of us that have plucked our right eye out, despite the fact of sinning. Paul said, Paul said this, he said that women should remain silent in church, not braid their hair or wear gold jewellery. I'd like to ask you this, how many Christians do you know that take all of those liter literally? Because I, I don't know any. Folks, we all interpret scripture. So the problem here with God settles, God said it, I believe it, that settles it, is that God said it part just isn't that straightforward. At times you come across people that have the idea that, 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 that the Bible is God's words just dictated exactly to the authors. Now, as a Bible, as a Baptist church, we believe and we've got no doubt that the Bible is the inspired, inspired word of God. As 2 Timothy 3.16 reminds us, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And we also know this and believe this, that the Bible reveals God's interactions with God's people. But not always the exact God's words. We don't ask people to believe in the Bible. We ask people, we encourage, we guide that people will believe in God. The God that the Bible points to. So God says it, I believe it, that settles it. It's not a false statement. But we have to we have to spend time studying the Bible and, and praying and figuring out ways of, of understanding what is God saying here? What's the Bible saying to us? Now, now, when determining what God is saying, we should always approach the Bible seeking to be guided by God's Holy Spirit. You know, when I do my devotions, um, the start of it all, I like to do a like a little simple prayer that 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 in some ways goes like this god I, I just want to hear from you today and i want to i want to understand what i'm about to read help me to understand it and then to be able to apply it into my day you know also to understand that god didn't stop speaking when the words of the bible were written two thousand years ago god still speaks to us and through us. And it's worth noting, studying the Bible can be done by ourselves. But my experience is that it can be best done when we do it in community together. Here's a question. Do you study the Bible with others? Because when we, when we study the scripture together and we seek to hear from the Holy Spirit, we, we can learn from multiple voices and, and different perspectives to the Bible. Now, importantly, when looking at a particular Bible passage, follow the guideline that the scripture interprets scripture. 
And, and this is one of the dangers with all these statements that we've looked at. We can just say the statement and it just ends there. We've got to be really careful. We don't just isolate one Bible verse and we avoid the whole context of what it's and how it's being said and where it's being said. Because that's a danger, as we said over the last few weeks. You know, Jesus in this passage, he does this. He references the creation story and the story of King David. You know, Jesus didn't interpret the law in a God said it, I believe it, that settles it kind of way in every situation. Don't, don't forget to keep in mind, as you study the Bible, as you look into the scriptures, the, the context that it was written in, who it was written to, the culture of where it was written. You know, and, and when we study scripture, determine, like, what is it saying for us today, to you today? How should this guide, how should this correct us? Interpret it through the lens of, of Jesus and the rule of bringing us closer to God, of loving God and loving one another. How, how does this scripture, how, how, how do I interpret this? To align myself with Jesus and his way, his teaching, his ministry. How, how will, as I interpret this scripture, how, how, will, how will this bring my actions more in line with a loving God and his ways? I want to say if you, you read a scripture and it leads you down a, a track that brings harm or, or hatred, that, that can't be of God. You know, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. It can, it, tr true at first reading, but it's not so, so true as often used by those who say it. You know, I had a bit of a go of rewording it with the help of a few things that I read. And I thought, how does this sound? God speaks in many ways. Through love and prayer, we do our best to listen and believe. We seek our best understanding of God through the Bible and remain open to God expanding or even correcting our understanding as we seek to live its words out as best we can. Not as catchy. Might not fit on a church sign or on a, on a sticker on your car. Grammar's not so great, but hey, the, the Bible shouldn't be used to end conversations. The Bible should be used to start conversations and to continue conversations. I'm guessing if you said to someone who's, who's a new follower of Jesus, that statement, hey, listen, the Bible said it, says it, that's it. No discussion. I, I sense that would push someone away from God. It's not, it's not a helpful thing to say. God, God's word is, is not to be used in a way, I believe, to end an argument. But rather an invitation to a deeper understanding and knowledge of God and, and his greatness. And, and, and how, to, how to live for him. And, and how to love him more and to how to love others. So I'd encourage you. Don't, don't say, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. I don't actually think that's a helpful saying. You know, as, as we come to the end of this series, we look back on what we've gone through of God help those statements where we've said God helps those who help themselves. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Money is the root of all evil. Everything works out for good. God won't give you more than you can handle. And God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Folks, they're misused statements. They're half truths at best at times. And by themselves, you won't find them in the Bible, they're context-missing statements. 
If there is some truth, you might be saying, well, if there's some truth to them, do we really need to be worried about saying them? Well, what if I say them and, I'm, and I mean well? Unfortunately, that, that's not enough. The reality of some of these statements, nearly all of them, in fact, all of them, they can actually hurt people. They can be destructive. People that are needing hope and healing can be pushed away. They can be discouraged and in fact they can drift or move right away from God because we can use some of these statements in such a way that draws them away from God, not nearer to him. Why, why would we not want to draw people near to him to tell them the, the whole truth about who God is, the God who loves them, who wants to support them and guide them in every step of life? I've got to say, I'm, I've been really thankful for the book Half Truth by Adam Hamilton. It's, it's been really helpful in this series and uh, there are a number of things in it that, that I've quoted from, hopefully honouring him through what I've shared. So I want to finish with a quote of his and then lead you straight into a prayer. He says, let's set aside half truths, eliminate them from our theological vocabulary and in their place, let's share and live the whole truth that God doesn't cause evil but redeems it. Let's share that God helps those who cannot help themselves. Let's seek to be the people through whom God works to help people handle all that life gives them. Let's read scripture not as a divine dictation, but as the witness of reflection of God's people, influenced by the Spirit, yet leaving room for questions. And let's be people whose lives and faith are defined by willingness to love. Let me pray. Dear God, how grateful we are for your love and grace. How grateful we are that you gave us the Bible, the scriptures as a gift for us to know you and know your purposes and will. How grateful we are that you sent Jesus Christ to be, to be the word made flesh. Help us to understand the scriptures. And God, when we look at Jesus, we, we see you. Help us to be people after his own heart. Help us to be people who read the scriptures, we study them, we memorize them and seek to live them as they align with the persons and the teachings of Jesus. And as we go from here today, for each of you, may the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you. Amen. Thanks for being with us. We'd love you to join us for the Zoom foyer experience uh, now. Uh, pretty much a wear closing song and then we'd love you to Zoom in. We'd love to see you. I'd love to see you. And the details will be in the Facebook chat. We look forward to you joining us next week as we have a testimony Sunday of different people from the church sharing how Jesus has impacted on their life. But thanks for being with us today.